Welcome to EVTN News. Um, I'm your host, John Son of Thunder, and today I have a lot of stories, but I, I thought it was kind of funny. I just came in, um, came off of Twitter, and the people were talking about how Sodom and Gomorrah, well, I guess it was a trending topic on Twitter, Sodom and Gomorrah was not it had nothing to do with the LMNOPs. It had everything to do with hospitality. They were not hospitable. That's what the far left claim is. And also I'm reading about communism and what the communists did to Christians. And uh, it's probably a topic for another video, but I'm in the process of doing that anyway. Uh, let's, let's talk about some heretics. A five-member panel at a... July 14th, Georgetown University Forum voiced their hesitancies with the Supreme Court's decision to ban child slaughter. Several of the uh, far-left reporters from heretical publications dis discussed how they were disappointed. No surprise. The head of the U.S. Bishop's Committee on Doctrine, Bishop Daniel Flores of Brownsville, Texas, said that the uh, Supreme Court controversy has eclipsed and drowned out other voices and issues that the church is concerned about. Certainly the death penalty and here on the border immigration reform, which affects real people, mothers who are expecting children, the mother who has children, and many more. So this bishop, uh, instead of celebrating the, the, the law overturn, or of the overturning of the law legalizing child slaughter, he uses it instead to say, oh, we need to focus on other issues, issues that are more important to him. And that's completely rotten. Bishop, Bishop Daniel Flores, that's who it is. So he's definitely not on our side. He's definitely on the side of the modernists. And at this point, we'll call it the communists, which uh, is not... The communists are not Catholic. They are anti-Catholic, opposing the Catholic faith. German synodal official, uh, Mark Frings, the Secretary General of the Central Committee of German Catholics said the Synodal Way was a conscious statement against the current Catholic catechism, which has been critical and disparaging of LMNOPs since the mid-1970s and still reproaches LMNOP activity as a sin. Uh, his comments were published on July 17th in German and English by Outreach, a website edited by Father James Martin. So... Father James Martin supports the German Synodal Way. We'll have more on that later. And uh, it, I don't know. You guys, I don't know if you'll be surprised. Uh, you might not be surprised to know what my opinion is on it. But that will be a little bit later in this video. But as for now, uh, the, a fact, the fact that the Secretary General of uh, the Central Committee of German Catholics said that the synodal way opposed the Catholic catechism is pretty significant, isn't it? Because when you have a so-called Catholic organization that uh, blatantly expresses their opposition, they, they said, we oppose the German catechism. Uh, or the, the Catholic, sorry, the Catholic catechism. <laughs> they, they created their own catechism, which actually really is the Lutheran, no... I don't even know if the Lutherans are that far out there. Maybe some of them are, but uh, these guys are just completely, you know, LMNLP worshipers. <clears throat> so Savannah, Georgia. There is an end date for the Latin Mass in Savannah, so I talked about this before, but I wanted to expand on it. Bishop Stephen Parks. Um, hold on one second. Okay, Bishop Stephen Parks of Savannah has announced the traditional Latin Masses in his Georgia diocese will cease in May 2023. The bishop said he had requested permission from the Vatican Dicastery for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments for parishes in his diocese to offer Mass according to 1962 Roman Missal and received a response from Rome containing the following. The Mass according to the Missale Romanum of 1962 may be celebrated at a parish at the parish of Sacred Heart in Savannah on a weekly basis until May 20th, 2023. Mass according to the Missale Romanum of 1962 may be celebrated at the parishes in 
uh, Augusta and Macon and Ray City on a monthly basis until May 20th, 2023. So they have an end date. Bishop Parks said, I am also aware that the eventual cessation of these masses will be difficult for many of the faithful in the diocese. Please know of my pastoral concern for you. Really? If you had a pastoral concern, you would take the diocese into your own hands instead of asking the Vatican whether you can do anything. Do you ask the Vatican if you can ordain priests? Do you ask the Vatican if you can reassign priests in different parishes? Do you ask the Vatican if there can be LMNOP um, ministries in your diocese? Do you ask, what do you ask the Vatican for? And Although, in terms of the Latin Mass, oh, we have to stomp out your Latin Mass. I'm very pastorally concerned for you. Well, guess what, Bishop? Your pastoral concern is going to lose a lot of money because these people are going to go to the SSPX. Hopefully. Uh, all right, so Pope Francis' visit to apologize for the fake news in Canada. Uh, the federal government in Canada says it will provide more than $35 million during the papal visit to Canada to support Indigenous communities, organizations, and residential school survivors. Um, <clears throat> it's going to cost $35 million on the Canadian taxpayer's dime. That's kind of close to U.S. dollars. Maybe it might be more like $30 million U.S. dollars. Who knows? But still a ton of money for the taxpayers to be, uh, for, for the wasted money from the taxpayers. Canada is basically a communist utopia, though. Pope Francis is set to travel to Alberta. He's already there. Alberta, Quebec, and Nanavut from July 24th to 29th. The papal visit is to include public and private events with an emphasis on indigenous participation, also pagan ceremonies. The Pope is expected to deliver an apology for the Roman Catholic Church's role in residential schools during the trip. Uh, in residential schools... I don't, uh, I don't know. The article doesn't really phrase it very accurately. Anyway, Indigenous Services Canada and Crown Indigenous Relations are putting the $30.5 million of the funds for community-led activities, ceremonies, and travel for survivors. <clears throat> Ottawa said another $3 million will support Indigenous groups in the three regions where Pope Francis will spend time. Yeah, so just give them money. Yeah, that works. Australian uh, Archbishop Timothy Costello of Perth, uh, the newly appointed president of the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference, says he would fully support a decision by Pope Francis to allow women to serve as ordained deacons. Heretic. He said the Catholic Church in Australia is now formally expressing that it is very open to this development should the Pope authorize it. And that would certainly be my approach. If authorized by the Pope, I would support this fully. So there you go. Rotten. Um, he replaced. He, I guess, Mark Coleridge was the Australian Bishops Conference. Archbishop Mark Coleridge was the Australian Bishops Conference president for a while, and uh, he was rotten. And they replaced him with another heretic, and that's what you get. And you know, I guess you have to have just cause to accuse someone of being a heretic. But anyone who supports women deacons, that's what they are. Easy to say. Um, Cardinal Pell's in the Vatican. That's where he's at. He's not in Australia, and uh, he's not saying anything about the Australians. We have very few allies, uh, at least in the high ranks of the episcopate. Episcopacy? I don't know. Uh, speaking of uh, McElroy... <laughs> Cardinal Bishop McElroy, Cardinal McElroy, well, Richard Sipes sent a letter in 2016 to Bishop McElroy containing statements from 12 seminarians who claim to be harassed by McCarrick. The conclusion of an article in, in, on uh, 1 Peter 5, which you can find in the description below, is that it implicates either McElroy or Pope Francis, or both, because they talked about the Penn State abuse uh, child abuse situation with Jerry Sandusky, and they said, well, administrators serve some jail time because they forward information to higher-ups instead of reporting it to police. And that's what Bishop McElroy did. He just forwarded it to the Vatican, apparently. 
I don't know. So, got lost in the shuffle somewhere. Or not. Alright, the Belgian Synodal Path. This is a little bit long, but I want to go over this. Um, the Belgian Synodal... Remember, Belgium has been a rotten... Uh, I don't even know what to, what, what to say about it. I mean, it's basically like another Germany. So, their decisions of the Synodal... If the Synod in Belgium, uh, five key points were published. So these are the results of the germ of the Belgian Synod. Uh, basically, I don't know if any of the people came and talked, but they said, number one, our dream, a church in solidarity. We dream of a church that can play a unifying role that is open to life-giving places of worship and attentive to changes in society. A church that experiences solidarity and mutual support that is open to other philosophies of life. We dream, dream of a church that is inclusive, encouraging, welcome to all, without distinction or judgment, compassionate and joyful, a church that sends us into the world and goes to the people where they live. So this point number one is basically saying, okay, we want everyone, uh, all lifestyles, even if they're sinful. Um, and also it seems to imply other faiths. So... Um, and one that modernizes with the times. Number two is diversity in the priesthood. The Catholic Church should be even more committed to diversity in its teaching. As in the Eastern Catholic Church's married priesthood should also be possible in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, in great respect for Christian churches that after deep deliberation made the decision to... Oh, here we go. Open the ordained ministry to women candidates. We ask for further reflections so that in the future the Catholic Church may recognize the vocation of women to the priesthood. Okay, this is Belgium. They said, indeed, the exclusion of certain topics from the theological agenda is at odds with a synodal culture in our church. So um, their goal is married priesthood and women priests. Number three, don't condemn, well, don't condemn relationships and sexuality. For cohabitating couples, element of P couples, and remarried persons separated from marriage, it is requested that the church answer their demand for recognition, ritual and social, from an interpretation of relationships and sexuality that is more consistent with the commandment of love. What? <laughs> this is like a communist, like atheist, well communism is atheism, it's state worship. Um, okay, number four is young people and newcomers. The expectation of young people is to be a contemporary church with attention to understandable liturgy in which they can participate. I, I know a liturgy. I know a type of liturgy that young people are attending. Um, but I don't think that's what the Belgians are referring to. They, they said, it said they expect us to focus on digital communication an authentic witness of faith, witnesses of faith who teach them the Christian story. There is a widely shared sense that the message of the church does not connect with the lives of people in our society today. Wonder why? For people who are outside the Christian faith, we hardly succeed in giving an expire giving an inspiring witness to what drives us for those who want to come close. Why do they care about who's outside the Christian faith? Isn't everyone inside the faith? Uh, for those who want to come closer, we fall back on proclamation and catechesis that are not catchy enough and therefore do not recruit. <laughs> for those who come to celebrate, we use liturgical language that alienates. <laughs> We have to work at translating and interpreting the good news for the concrete context of our society. Uh, honestly, I have no idea what they actually attend with this radical liturgical change. I don't know. I really don't. But it would be some kind of ridiculous nonsense. I, I honestly, I'd like to see it. I would. Because they, they're already in heresy. I mean, all these points that I've listed are, are heresy. Um, number five is church is so much more than Sunday Mass. Well, that's kind of an important part of church, isn't it? Uh, they said there's also a need for new places outside the parish, the parishes, to experience faith and build bridges. Oh, 
Oh, there we go. Between different paths of interiority to walk the path of Christian prayer. There you go. Um, yes. Okay. Thanks for commenting, everyone. I'll get to those in a little bit. All right, we're getting to one of the bigger stories. Cardinal Dolan. Now, I didn't like this article by LifeSite News. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> well, I mean, that's why you're listening. I'll tell you why. Uh, so, I'll read this. Car LifeSite said, Cardinal Timothy Dolan of New York recently gave an endorsement of Father James Martin's activism in the dissident Jesuits' new LMNOP group outreach. <clears throat> so, Cardinal Dolan wrote a letter. It's very short. He said, Dear friends in the Lord, Thank you for the chance to greet you as you gather for the Outreach 2022 conference at Fordham University. Jesus' last words to the disciples before his ascension into heaven was to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's outreach. Yours is an important ministry as you work with all those seeking a closer relationship with Jesus and his church. No one should ever feel that they are alienated from God's love or ineligible for his grace and mercy, to work for the church's heightened sensitivity to those who feel left out and to propose to, to all the saving message of salvation and the virtue of chastity as revealed in God's holy word is a noble task. And so, um, <clears throat> I said, may your, may your conference strengthen you. And through the intercession of Mary, our mother, St. Joseph, her husband, and St. Patrick, the patron saint of the Archdiocese, may God bless you and all and those you serve. So, he kind of praises them. He acknowledge, First of all, he acknowledges the conference. And then he says, um, the virtue of, he, he mentions the virtue of chastity. Now, LifeSite News does not mention that at all in their article. So I don't like that. And they said, Cardinal Dolan praises Father James Martin's group. And he kind of does, and he kind of tolerates it, which is rotten. Absolutely rotten. But he does try to throw that little bit of, bit in there. The virtue of chastity is revealed in God's holy word. How many of them attending? Never mind. I don't even want to ask. Um, okay, the Pontifical Academy for Life has gone off the rails. Pope Francis said... Uh, Okay, so I'm, I'm going back to Pope Francis' quote here. He said, In some places, media sites have become places of toxicity, toxicity, hate speech, and fake news. Following the Pope's message, the Pontifical Academy for Life welcomed his message and used it to defend themselves amid controversy following the publication of a new book promoting contraception. The, the Pontifical Academy for Life wrote that it had been a recipient of many unwarranted violent attacks for many Catholics, or supposedly so, all expert theologians. Uh, they said, the Pope's message supports all of us who seek to communicate a church of mercy and dialogue. How about a church of truth? How about a church of faith? How about a church of doctrine and morality? Wouldn't that be a good idea? Instead of a church of dialogue? Because what does dialogue mean? It means you reject the Catholic faith. The Pontifical Academy for Life is rotten. And... There, there were rumors, who knows, that Pope Francis was going to release an encyclical um, rejecting Humana Vitae, but that was just the rumors online, and there are plenty of rumors, and not all of them are true. Let's, let's, let's um, talk about the facts here. Archbishop Paul Gallagher, the Vatican's Secretary for Relations with States, said in, said in an interview with uh, Jesuit... Um, publication, America Magazine. He said, I would say that our exchanges, the Vatican's exchanges, with the Biden administration are frequent, particularly through the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See. They come and tell us things that they're working on, and we obviously take note of those things, and we make some, and we make our comments on them. Sometimes we don't always respond in the way that they would wish, but it is a very positive relationship in the sense that I don't think we have any hesitation to approach them whether it's the embassy or the State Department or the White House. And they don't have any hesitation to do the same here. 
which I think is very positive because that's not always the case in bilateral relations. So compared to the previous administration, it's easier now. Really. The previous administration's president didn't pretend to be Catholic. He said even with the previous administration, there was a lot of exchange with the embassy here, but frankly speaking, I think we found that we didn't see quite as eye to eye with the previous administration as we do with this one. What does that say about the Vatican? It says they support abortion. Oh, or maybe abortion is not important. Obviously, we have difficulties with this administration as well, which are well known. What? What difficulties do they have with, the, with this administration? I don't see any. Uh, they said, but at the, he said, but at the same time, there are other issues on which we can work uh, very well. Most of the positions, I would say, are issues on which both sides recognize the importance and sometimes the sensitivity of the issues. And we have often quite differing views, but there is a desire to exchange. Uh, let's see. One would assume that a credible journalist or publication would ask about the largest controversy, but none of the fault, none of uh, but all of the questions that followed were focused on far-left political goals. Speaking of the Vatican, we're getting to the German synodal way. In order to protect... Okay, so they, they issued a statement on the German synodal way. It was not a criticism. Well, I mean, it could be. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. A very short statement. In order to protect the freedom of the people of God and exercise and they exercise the Episcopal ministry, it seems necessary to specify that the synodal path in Germany has no power to oblige the bishops and the faithful to adopt new ways of governing and new approaches to doctrine and moral morals, probably. It would not be lawful to initiate new official structures or doctrines and dioceses before an agreement is agreed at the level of the universal church, which would represent a wound to ecclesial communion and a threat to the unity of the church. As the Holy Father recalled in the letter to the people of God who are on their way in Germany, the universal church lives in and of the particular churches, just as the particular churches live and flourish in and from the universal church, and if they find themselves separated from the entire ecclesial body, they weaken, rot, and die. Hence, the need to keep communion with the whole body of the church always alive and effective. Therefore, it is hoped that proposals of the way of the particular churches in Germany will converge on the synodal path that the universal church is taking for a mutual enrichment of a testimony of that unity with which the body of the church manifests its fidelity to Christ the Lord. Okay, so I want to um, take you back and it says, It would not be lawful to initiate new official structures or doctrines in dioceses before an agreement agreed at the level of the universal church. So what this means is that the Vatican's saying, don't change doctrine before we do. That's what it means. They're not criti they're criticizing the German synodal way because they're moving too quickly, not because they're moving in a heretical direction. So this statement says a lot of nothing. But the conservatives on EWTN are going to tell you, oh, the Vatican criticizes the German synodal path. Yeah, they criticize them moving too fast. They didn't criticize their at least four points of heresy. And then the German synodal way responded. Bishop Georg Batzing of Limburg and Ermi Steller Karp, the, uh, I don't even think she's a nun, she's like a laywoman, call her a bus nun anyway, declared, in our understanding, a synodal church is something else. This also applies to the way today's communication has been handled, which has been a source of astonishment for us. It is not a good example of communication within the church if statements are published which are not signed by name. Hmm. We never tire of underlining that the church in Germany will not follow a special German path. Nevertheless, we see it as our duty to clearly state where we believe changes are necessary. Um, as far as I know, there has been no response from the Vatican. <laughs> I mean, just kind of a tentative, oh, you shouldn't move faster than we are in changing doctrine. And I think the Vatican's deliberate changes, 
I think they're more effective because the Catholics uh, see it as a, a problem, but then when you're when you're doing a little bit uh, bits and pieces here and there, who really knows? All right, let's go. Let's go. Let's move to Opus Dei, and there has been reaction online. And if you haven't checked out my Opus Dei video, I did an Opus Dei video with Brett and Ryan on this channel. It's about 20 minutes, maybe a little longer. And we talked about Opus Dei, the secrecy, and how they're not traditionalists. They're not really even conservatives. Um, but anyway, they got denied a bishop by the Vatican. The, the Vatican Dicastery uh, of Reference for Opus Dei will, be, will no longer be the one for bishops, but the one for clergy, to which the prelate, the highest Opus Dei authority, will submit an annual report on the sta state of the prelature. The prelate himself, contrary to the past, will no longer be able to be appointed a bishop, and this, the motu proprio explains uh, in Article 4, is to reinforce the conviction. Okay, whatever. So no no more bishops for Opus Dei. They're, they're known as blind obedience, the, the blind obedience crowd. And um, <clears throat> that's what you get for obedience. Will they speak out? I think there are several secret members of Opus Dei in, that are cardinals, probably a lot of bishops. Uh, Archbishop Gomez is an open Opus Dei member, and you can see what that does. Um, it doesn't really uh, it doesn't really do much. But the the money behind Opus Dei is said to be significant, and so we will see what happens here. Um, moving back to heresy, Cardinal Hollerick S. J. will visit the United States. He said that the church teaching on LMNOP was no longer correct, and he supports women priests. And so there's a number of Luxembourg, he's from Luxembourg, Cardinal Hollerick S.J., he's from Luxembourg, and a number of cultural groups, they're like Luxembourg uh, based, not, not based, but Luxembourg, like United States cultural groups, are sponsoring the Cardinal's visit to the Midwest, apparently. But uh, Luxembourg's in Europe, why would he feel the need to come to the United States? All these cultural, like, there are a lot of cultural festivals, so why is he coming to some small Midwest um, celebration? So, the, this his visit to the United States, he's, he's completely compromised. Um, he's, he's absolutely on the side of heresy. He's a complete Francis Church cardinal. He's coming to the United States from July 31st to August 14th, and he's spending some time first in Chicago, Illinois. Hmm. Maybe he's going to talk to his good buddy Supich. Maybe they have stuff to discuss. Are there going to be other cardinals in the region at that point? Is there a future pope that they want to discuss? Holding this pre-conclave meetings. It's not the St. Gallen Mafia, will you call it the, uh, what, the Sololinsky Mafia? You know what I'm talking about. He's going to visit Chicago, uh, St. Donatus, Iowa, New Ulm, Minnesota, La Crosse, Wisconsin. He'll be in, um, wh wh who's the bishop of La Crosse? Father Altman's bishop. Bishop uh, Callahan. Is he going to meet up? Is he going to take a, Is he going to take the opportunity to meet up with Bishop Callahan and Monsignor Grinder in uh, Wisconsin? Is Bishop Callahan going to speak out against this guy who spoke out against the Catholic faith? I don't know. I don't think so. But he is going to keep Father Altman suspended. He's going to Port Washington, Wisconsin, and Belgium, Wisconsin. And to me, I thought that was very shady. Why is he coming to the United States? <clears throat> Ooh, New Alma's Bishop Barron. Well, does Bishop Barron support the LMNOPs? He, he did say that Father James Martin is a winsome guide for Catholic spirituality. All right, and finally, the last story of the day, the one you've all been waiting for, Father Heilman. 
Bishop Hying of Madison has taken current disciplinary action regarding uh, Father Richard Heilman in the Diocese of Madison, who has engaged in online social media and other activity involving statements, this is from the diocese, bearing inordinately on controversy stemming from the electoral political realm. The details of priest personnel matters, including any specific disciplinary actions taken in this case, generally remain confidential and involve the duty to protect the good reputation of the involved parties. So why is he issuing a public statement saying nothing? Makes no sense. Uh, Bishop Hying kicked out Father Z. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Father Z. He runs a blog and he's on Twitter. I uh, kicked him out. Father Z was at Father Heilman's parish for a while until Bishop Hying kicked him out. The, the, the story I got is that Father Heilman... Let me think about how to phrase this. Whenever there was an event that took place at the Capitol building, uh, I think Father Heilman encouraged donating to the, the legal team that's on the good side of that. I'm trying to talk about that as... You know what I'm saying. Anyway, um, I just... I think this is rotten. Bishop Hying is, is considered one of the good bishops. He speaks out in favor of pro-life, but whenever it comes to his priests, he says, oh, nope, don't talk about any of that controversial stuff. Really? Our faith is controversial. Now, Father Heilman, he's on, uh, US, he's on the U.S. Grace Force. Po uh, I think that's what this podcast is called. And it's Roman Catholic gear. I mean, that's what they sell. Uh, it's their, their, like, merch website. And I thought, you know what? Like, why is a priest selling stuff on the Roman Catholic gear? Well, you know why? <laughs> it's because when he gets canceled, he's going to need some kind of income. So, uh, anyway, this disciplinary action wasn't public. I don't know what he got, a slap on the wrist? Who knows? But uh, this is, this is, uh, I don't know. Does Bishop Hying, does he uh, punish priests for saying irreverent novus ordos? Because I think that would be more of an offense than Father Heilman saying something on a podcast. I mean, come on. It's ridiculous. All right, I see a lot of comments. So thank you, everyone, for commenting. Thank you for watching. Um... Okay, I actually saw someone maybe a year ago suggest Jesus would be a communist, and I had some righteous anger for that person. Well, I'm reading about communists, and the way they persecuted Christians is terrible. Like, I don't even have a word for it. Terrible is not even a, a good word for it. Uh, persecution of all good shepherds. So this clearly shows it's not really about just banning the TLM. Father Heilman is a good... A strong good shepherd, very reverent Novus Ordo in his church. He also says the Latin Mass. Um, okay. Hold on. All right, where are we at? Well, SSPX must expand. Yeah, I'm worried about that. I don't think they can expand as quickly. Where's Cardinal Pell? He's not in Australia. I'll tell you that. Uh... Most precious blood of Jesus Christ devotion warned of married priests back in the 90s. Married priests is one thing, but asking for women deacons, and then, of course, their big ask would be demanding women priests. Yeah, so um, the Eastern Rites do have married priests, and actually there are quite a few married priests in the Eastern Rite. I, personally, am not a fan of married priests. I, I want to say it this way. I know married priests that are really good, really good priests. I just don't think that um, married men should be ordained to the priesthood. Now, on the Eastern Rite, it is a little bit different, but I still think that married priests or priests should not be married, whether regardless of what rite it is. So, um, I don't know. Now, the married priest, I mean, if you have a family, you know, if you look, and I watched, uh, I think it was on Pines with Aquinas, there was a Byzantine priest, and he said that at least in the Roman ordination rite, even the diaconate, because you know how there's married men in the Novus Ordo that are ordained to the diaconate. In the diaconate, 
the, the wife, and, and Ryan talked about this years ago, the wife of a priest is part of the ordination ceremony. Basically, the, the, not the priest, the, the, the wife of the person to be ordained deacon is part of the ordination ceremony. And the, uh, basically the, the ordained man renounces the marital rights to his wife. So, I mean, okay, where are we at? Christ dictates seem to be communist manifestos. Yeah, sure. Um, Eastern rites are privy to married priests. Uh, yeah, God bless those who remain celibate for the kingdom. I think that was in the book of the apocalypse, wasn't it? Um, priests must marry before being ordained in the Eastern rites. Yes, definitely. And you can't be married if uh, you are bumped up to bishop. And so that's why some of the Eastern bishops are actually Roman Catholics. Uh, okay. Let's see. No, no marriage after ordination. Yeah. Um, I don't think the wives, I don't know that the wives work to supplement income. I mean, the wives are supposed to raise a family. So the priests that push more, more pressure on the priests to um, make an income. And so Father Dwight Longenecker He's a married priest in South Carolina. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but uh, he posts a lot of controversial statements online on Twitter, and he writes some articles that are very, um, what should I say, controversial. And I wonder if that's intentional. You know, if I if I had a video with a controversial opinion, I would get more clicks. That's all I'm gonna say. Patty, great question. Where's McCarrick? I've been talking about this for a while. His trial was supposed to be in March, and apparently it was postponed, but there's no record of it that I can find online, and no one's talking about it. Why? Why is none of the Catholic media talking about this? I'm not paid to do that. I mean, I get some ad revenue here and there. I might make, what, like 20 or 30 cents off of this video, but why is no one talking about McCarrick anymore? His money is influencing the church. His bishops the bishop city consecrator influencing the church. McElroy was was just named a cardinal. So why is no one talking about McCarrick? Is that old news? Oh, the Vatican issued this uh, research document that excluded a ton of information, but oh, it's over. Whatever. Okay. Soviet Russia got rid of 149 million Catholics. I'm reading about that right now. I'll, I'll let you know my thoughts, and it's not going to be good. Priest earns such a small stipend, how would he be able to take care of a family? A second job. That's how. And if if you have if, if the priest has several children that they need to, uh, a family that they need to support, then it's it's difficult. But um, celibacy is the preferred option for the priesthood, and. I don't think that's just exclusive to the Roman Rite. I know the Eastern Rites, the Eastern Rites are, um, they're open to that. But I'm going to say, I'm going to make a prediction. I mean, I expect married priests to be uh, increasingly common in the Roman Rite. I don't think that uh, the celibate priesthood will always be a thing in the traditional orders. I think that we're going to see a lot of a lot more married priests in the next few, even in the next few years, Maybe not because it might take a little bit longer to get through seminary, but I think in like five to ten years, I do expect a significant number of married priests in the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. Church. Um, okay. So, oh, I just got a spam message. Dang it. <laughs> I pay for my text messages. Anyway, uh, priest celibacy means more than 20, means more 24 7 availability. Yes, that's true. Um, Okay, so that's well, all I have today. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to EVTN News. Uh, if you're watching this uh, post uh, after the live show, please leave, you know, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think on any of these topics. Thank you so much for watching. This has been EVTN News. We are the laity, and we will not be silent.